Yeah, all right, so welcome everybody. So this is the last talk for the, for the academic semester for this uh, special interest group. And uh, yeah, we'll stop for a little while and then we'll probably resume in October or so. Uh, so today it's my pleasure to welcome uh, William uh, Redman who will be talking about Koopman mode and uh, CP decomposition. Yeah, thank you. Great, yeah, well, thanks so much for the invitation, Bomadine, and for putting together this uh, great uh, community. It's been awesome to see it um, growing and, and to get to be a part of it and now and I feel lucky to uh, now get to be able to sort of contribute something to it. Um, so for those of you that don't know, know me, I'm uh, Will. I'm just finishing my third year as a PhD student um, in the Dynamical Neuroscience Department at UC Santa Barbara. And today I'll be talking about uh, Koopman mode decomposition and how it compares to another um, sort of data-driven unsupervised decomposition technique called CP decomposition. Um, and if you're unfamiliar with CP decomposition, uh, the CP part stands for different things depending on who you ask. Um, so it can stand for sort of canonical polyadic decomposition or cadent comp parafact decomposition, which is a mouthful. And those are two uh, sort of acronyms that have been stitched together, uh, unfortunately. And then it's also known as multi way factorization and uh, tensor component analysis. So it goes by many names because it's been discovered um, at multiple time points by multiple people under the context of multiple different fields. But um, from my understanding, the machine learning community generally refers to it as a CP decomposition. But if you've heard of it as any of the others, that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, and so the, as the title suggests, the, the main sort of uh, topic of today's talk will be uh, on an intersection between Koopman operator theory, which is a dynamical systems theory, and machine learning. And uh, I know there's uh, been a number of talks uh, at this for this group about um, one in such an intersection, which has been machine learning for um, computing relevant Koopman quantities. And, and this has been very popular um, in the past three or four years, and there's been some exciting results. And so it's sort of a growing subfield and people have found that they can use feed forward neural networks and auto encoders, and even recently reservoir computers um, to estimate these sort of Koopman quantities. And uh, very recently, sort of on the other direction, people have started to use Koopman uh, to compute machine learning relevant quantities. So um, people have sort of estimated the Koopman operator associated with uh, standard neural network training and have shown that, that uh, it can actually be more efficient and faster to do it using Koopman. Um, there's been some work on predicting the number of layers you'll need for a hierarchical support vector machine to reach some sort of uh, minimum threshold and error. And then also uh, recently, there's been some nice work on using Koopman to understand and sort of pick apart uh, recurrent neural networks. And so between these two, it seems like we've sort of caught, um, or, you know, caught all the intersections because we've talked about machine learning for Koopman and Koopman for machine learning. But of course, there's a third uh, intersection which has been around actually before even both of these. And that's been looking at when is Koopman and certain different machine learning methods equivalent um, and of course, this was most famously done um, when uh, it was shown that dynamic mode decomposition, which depending on who you ask, uh, may or may not be a machine learning method, uh, can be when, it, when and is it uh, equivalent to uh, a Koopman mode decomposition. And uh, then also recently, there's been some work uh, looking at how Koopman can be equivalent to um, reservoir computing. And this is this is especially uh, of interest, both because um, by noting these different equivalences, it's given the Koopman community more tools and toolbox to compute um, the Koopman modes. And, and of course, uh, DMD has been has led has been part of the huge explosion of interest in, in Koopman. But also, um, this uh, sort of equivalence allows us to start to, in a more grounded way doing comparisons between Koopman methods and, and other machine learning methods, um, which even if you're a hardcore Koopman person or a hardcore machine learning person, of course, you know that uh, all of these methods are ultimately limited in some way and having a good sense of which one's uh, best suited for what problem is important, especially as we move on to, uh, you know, bigger scale problems. So the, the talk is going to be focused on, on this last sort of intersection between Koopman and, and machine learning. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be talking about how Koopman, when and how Koopman mode decomposition can be equivalent to CP decomposition um, and what that tells us about their sort of comparison. And this is the main motivation and, and the one that I thought would be most relevant um, 
to this group, but but also, of course, many people um, who study uh, dynamical systems and machine learning are also interested in specific um, uh, complex systems. And it turns out that uh, CPD composition is um, something that's been used and is becoming especially popular in some of the same fields that are most hesitant of uh, Koopman. So for instance, in neuroscience, uh, which is my own sort of background, and, but also in chemistry and to some extent biology, um, these are fields that Koopman has been applied to uh, a little bit, and there've been some nice papers um, showing some nice results, but those sort of, that work very much remains outside of the mainstream um, and is seen as sort of being a niche a part of the, the field. And so, um, uh, and from my, from my own experience, it seems a, a lot like there are two reasons for this hesitancy in these kinds of fields. Um, so the first is that operator theory in general is unfamiliar to a lot of people, especially people who are coming from hardcore backgrounds in, the, in these fields. And, and being a sort of prudent scientists, they, they don't want to use a method that they're ultimately, uh, they don't understand. And then sort of relatedly, because the underlying theory is, is unfamiliar, um, the, it's often difficult to communicate what advantages you might expect to see uh, using Koopman over sort of existing standard methods. And that leads to a lot of experimentalists thinking, you know, aren't existing methods good enough? Um, isn't Koopman just sort of an overly fancy way of getting the same, the same results that I would have gotten? And of course, uh, those of us who are familiar with Koopman know that this isn't, uh, isn't necessarily true and that when Koopman is applied correctly, um, there's certainly many advantages that can be uh, found over lots of existing methods. So it's sort of on us to, to try and bridge um, the gap between standard methods that are used in some of these fields and, and, and Koopman methods. And, and specifically for this reason, um, it, by explicitly connecting CBD composition with, with Koopman methods, uh, that would help us to communicate with experimentalists because instead of talking about Koopman eigenfunctions and, and Koopman modes, it'd be possible to sort of point to terms um, that they're more familiar with in CPD composition that are in some sense equivalent uh, to the Koopman, to the Koopman uh, variables. And, and also, like I said in the last slide, um, it would allow for a more grounded comparison between the two because since they've been largely used in um, disjoint fields, it's been unclear whether they, when one was used, uh, instances where one was used might have actually benefited from the use of uh, or the application of the other. And so this talk is going to focus on uh, connecting a machine learning approach to a Koopman um, approach, but at the same time reminding, remembering that this is sort of a two birds and one scone situation, because at the same time, we'll also be uh, building uh, a framework to connect Koopman to a lot of uh, to fields that are often used uh, CPD composition, where Koopman hasn't really been used in the past. So um, the rest of the talk, it will be structured as the the following, and it, and it looks like a, a bunch of uh, bullet points, but each of these are only a slide or two, so it won't take too long. Um, but I'll first sort of more uh, specifically actually write down the problem statement and talk about which um, uh, sort of what assumptions I'm gonna be taking and what kind of data I'll be interested in. Then I'll give details about um, CPD composition because as of yet, I've been pretty vague. Um, I'll talk about doing dynamic mode decomposition on tensors. Um, the asterisk series to remind us that the, these tensors are actually going to have a sort of pretty specific structure, um, and which is makes this sort of distinct from some of the work that's being done on uh, more general tensors. And then with this background, I'll be able to you know write out the correspondence between CPD composition and Koopman mode decomposition. And I'll give a very uh, simple numerical example just to show you that um, this correspondence holds in practice, um, and and that. Uh, numerical implementations of both of these methods actually gives us the same, or, uh, you know, the, this, this equivalence, uh, which is uh, non-trivial. And then uh, I'll end by comparing Koopman and uh, CPD composition and talking about some of the open questions that have emerged, um, because these there are a number of them. Um, so uh, as many of you know, it, um, in machine learning and also in some of these experimental fields I've talked about uh, earlier, uh, Data often isn't represented as a matrix, but as a, as a tensor. So if you're doing image classification for, say, MNIST, you're given a stack of images, which you can think about, about as being as a tensor. Or if, um, if you're doing getting data from a neuroscience experiment, um, you might have individual uh, 
it's trials um, where each trial you show some sort of stimulus, but you're recording from a population of neurons, uh, their activity across time, and you do this for a bunch of different trials, and so you've effectively stacked um, uh, a bunch of these data matrices along a third uh, dimension. And so, again, your, your data is most uh, naturally represented as a tensor. And especially in these experimental fields, but to some extent in the machine learning community as well, for a long time, historically, the um, first step that's done is to use a principal component analysis, uh, so PCA, or also um, it's also known as principal orthogonal decomposition. And, and this is nice, I mean, PCA is a ubiquitous and very powerful tool, but ultimately it's a matrix method. And so this requires um, some sort of flattening of the, of the tensor. And so this can be done in multiple different ways. The one way is to actually um, average over the trials. And this is nice because it removes trial to trial variability. But if this variability isn't just noise, but in fact, uh, there's some sort of learning signal there or some sort of adaptation in your system, then this gets washed out. Um, and so obviously that's problematic. And then uh, similarly, if you concatenate all your um, trials together, so you, you don't lose the variability, um, but if each one of these trials has a slightly different temporal factor, then um, uh, if treating it as a single matrix leads to problems. And so this has led uh, in part to a, a, a need or and also a, sort of an understanding that maybe matrix methods aren't best for uh, data that's ultimately uh, tensorial. And so the best thing that you do is to use methods that respect the fact that the, tens uh, the data is a tensor. And so this has given rise to tensor component analysis, um, which like I said, is one of the names that CPD composition goes by. And um, in addition to uh, not re having, requiring that you have to flatten your data, CPD composition has a few nice properties that are baked into it. Um, so these are uh, properties two here, which is that the modes don't have to be orthogonal, which of course is a somewhat of a major um, uh, restriction in PCA that modes have to be orthogonal, which in many physical systems doesn't make uh, sense. And then also the modes can be unique, which in general is not true of PCA. Um, and this has led uh, the community of field in general that CPD composition is more interpretable than PCA. And that's an interpretable sort of decomposition technique in general. And so this has uh, been a major part of why uh, machine learning people have been interested in this is, since, you know, mach uh, interpretable machine learning is, is always something that's strived for, but is sort of challenging. Um, CPD decomposition has that sort of interpretability built in. And then also, um, I should say that uh, all these properties make CPD composition appealing to, to experimentalists, but also um, CPD composition is, is related to PCA and can be seen as sort of like a generalization of PCA, which I won't get into, but um, uh, this has made uh, experimentalists um, sort of more comfortable in using it because they can inherit their t intuition for PCA um, into CPD composition. So, so this is uh, sort of one, these are some of the reasons why CPD composition is used at all. Um, and they're, they're very nice advantages. Um, now, to actually give you some details about what CP decomposition is, the goal of CP is to, um, given a tensor Y, find um, triplets, uh, which are these vectors A, Bs, and Cs, that when you take their outer product and, and sum over all the triplets, you get a nice reconstruction of Y. And this is uh, schematically shown um, on the right. And if, if you're interested on CP decomposition, the, the place that everyone starts is, this really nice review by Colvin and Bader. Um, it's got a lot of detail and, and makes the uh, sort of scattered literature a lot more um, digestible. So I definitely recommend it. And in practice, to actually find these triplets, um, various different optimization techniques are used, such as alternating and nonlinear least squares, where your objective function is um, some sort of norm of uh, the difference between y and, and your reconstruction. But uh, there's also been some nice work looking at different objective functions um, and showing that uh, sometimes that's, that's helpful. Uh, and CP decomposition has a few uh, important properties or properties that will be relevant for this talk. So the first one is that um, there's a, a thing called the rank of a tensor, which is optimal to notice R star. And that's the minimum number of uh, triplets you need for there to be a perfect 
the decomposition. And in practice, R star is actually uh, very non-trivial to find. And so there, if your uh, tensor has some sort of very specific shapes, uh, there's some uh, bounds on what R star is. But in general, most like real world examples don't fall into those sort of classes. And so um, to figure out R star, you have to do some sort of cross validation scheme where you withhold some amount of your data. And then like on 80% of your data, you um, compute a bunch of different CP decomposition models uh, where you vary the number of triplets or modes you consider. And then on the remaining 20% of the data that you've left out, you test these different models and see which one is the smallest model that uh, reaches some sort of threshold on accuracy or, or performance. Um, but uh, it's certainly not like a, a strict thing, the, the computation of R star. And um, it's uh, in practice a little bit of an art in figuring out how many modes to, to include. And then, like I said earlier, this decomposition can be unique. And there are a few um, statements that are known to uh, be sufficient for uniqueness. The most famous one is, is here, um, which is pretty easily verifiable if you have R star. Uh, and I should say that the A's, the B's, and the C's here are the matrices whose columns are the uh, lowercase A's, uh, B's, and C's. And uh, so one thing that's done in practice is, like I said, R star is sort of difficult to compute. But um, if you can, if you know the sort of the ranks of the A's, the B's, and the C's, um, and it's sufficiently large, then you, you might say that, well, I'm not entirely sure what R star is, but there's a good chance that my decomposition is going to be unique. Um, so those are the main sort of the details about CP decomposition that, that will be relevant. There, there are many more uh, details. Uh, and like I said, if you're interested, you should check out the review by Kolda and Bader. Um, but now we're going to switch gears and talk about um, exact dynamic mode decomposition. So as I'm sure many of you are familiar with exact DMD, but to sort of uh, briefly recall, um, we remember that exact DMD is usually done on uh, two matrices, X and Y. And here, I'll assume that um, these the columns of X and the columns of Y are um, consecutive snapshots of the system. So if Z0 is the initial condition uh, in state space variables, then T and T is the flow map, then the next column of X will be T applied to Z0, which is Z1. Um, and, and so on. And then y is x time shifted one, one time step ahead. And uh, exactMD considers this operator a, uh, which is the least squared solution um, to y minus ax. Uh, and we say that y and x, x and y are, are linearly consistent if the null space of y contains the null space of x. And if this is, if x and y are linearly consistent, um, this is sort of relevant because uh, assuming A also has a full set of eigenvalues, then um, AX is equal to Y exactly. So we have this Y minus AX is equal to zero. And uh, we can rewrite uh, AX by sort of playing a notational game as the uh, sum of the Koopman eigenfunctions times the outer product of the uh, Koopman modes and their time evolution. Um, and the sort of time evolution here, of course, is given in integer powers of um, the eigenvalues. Uh, and this is just a notational thing, but it'll come in handy on the next slide, where we consider um, doing exact DMD on data tensors. And, and again, these tensors are going to take on the structure that I mentioned earlier, which is that each one of the um, uh, slices through the frontal slices through the data tensor is going to come from uh, the same dynamical system, uh, but maybe with different initial conditions. And so, um, uh, yeah, so maybe we'll assume that we have a few different initial conditions, then it's not uh, enough, of course, to consider the eigenfunctions evaluated as single uh, initial condition, but instead we want to consider the vector uh, where each element of the vector is um, the eigenfunction evaluated at one of these uh, different initial conditions. And um, if X and Y, which are now tensors, are linearly consistent, and by that I mean if each one of their frontal slices is linearly consistent, and each one of the A's that comes from these frontal slices is has a full set of eigenvalues, then um, y, the, the, the tensor minus the sum of these outer products of the Koopman modes and their time evolutions and the, the eigenfunctions is going to be equal to 0. So hopefully, this is somewhat clear. And, and um, also, hopefully, this sort of looks familiar. And indeed, uh, if when x and y are linearly consistent, 
and A has a full set of eigenvectors and um, uh, or eigenvalues, sorry, I think the table. And then uh, if the number of modes we're considering is greater than or equal to the uh, tensor rank, then we have these two equations, one coming in the top one coming from um, Kuhlman mode decomposition, or it's specifically exact in D, and the bottom one coming from CP decomposition. And they've been put uh, suggestively to make you uh, sort of come to the conclusion that there's a very natural correspondence between the two um, decompositions where the eigen uh, Kuhlman modes can be seen as uh, being analogous to the A's in CP decomposition. The, um, uh, their time evolution can be seen as being similar or analogous to the B's and the, their um, dependence on initial condition through the eigen functions can be seen as sort of similar to the, to the C's. And this correspondence is in fact exact, so that we lose these arrows and gain uh, equal signs if uh, the number of modes we're considering is equal to the tensor rank and the A's, the B's, and the C's are unique, so this you know, property at the bottom holds. And uh, I should say that, so this is of course, uh, this reaches our goal of wanting to show that you know, when these two methods are equivalent, um, it's strongly limited by the fact that we have to assume linear consistency in a full set of eigenvalues. But uh, it's worth pointing out that these other two conditions, uh, sort of the ones related to the uniqueness of CP decomposition, are to some extent superfluous because um, if they aren't uh, true, so there are multiple decompositions that satisfy the CP decomposition, um, the Koopman modes uh, will, will be equivalent to one of those. And so, uh, you know, in the future, it might even be well motivated to, to say uh, sort of definitionally that the CP decomposition is equivalent to um, exact DMD modes uh, when there are multiple. Uh, multiple uh, sets that satisfy the, the equation. Um, so to give you uh, a brief example of actually showing that this, this holds in practice, um, I, I constructed a very simple linear system where you know, I, I enforced the fact that this system came from some sort of OEE, but I randomly generated all the other values. And I did this 100 times. Um, and in the average discrepancy between the exact DMD modes, which is shown here in blue, and, and the CP modes, um, which is shown in red, was you know uh, within precision, and uh, you can see that here uh, they, they give all the same uh, decompositions of the data, so they're extracting the same dynamics, um, uh, both in terms of the sort of the modes, so the, how much each of the parts of the system participates in each one of the modes, their time evolution, and also their dependence on initial condition. Um, which can take sort of complicated uh, or nonlinear forms here. And if you're at all interested in CP decomposition, you should check out, uh, or I would recommend checking out Tensor Lab, um, which is a free open source software package for MATLAB. Unfortunately, the support for um, doing this, these kinds of CP decompositions in Python is relatively limited, although I think of this. Um, so, uh, but Tensor Lab's got some really great documentation, and it's a good place to start. So to uh, sort of start to wrap up, um, uh, like I said, one of the main goals of this, this work was to find an equivalence, which in addition to helping with communication and, and being sort of of uh, academic interest and, and also, I guess, giving Koopman people a new uh, a tool to, to use um, it, when, these, when the equivalence holds. Uh, the, and another driving sort of interest was to do a more formal comparison between the two. Um, so we can do that now uh, that we have the equivalence. So as you might have seen, all of the uh, restrictions that came from the equivalence of Koopman mode decomposition and CV decomposition came from the Koopman side, um, and in particular the fact from the fact that I used exact D&D. And um, a lot of them have to do with the fact that Koopman, of course, is a linear theory. And um, if you're using just state space data, then ultimately you can only sort of extract modes that are exponential. Uh, in time, and those, and so that is, you know, they're, they're either exponentially growing or shrinking or oscillating. Whereas CP decomposition takes no um, a priori, no assumptions about what the, the time uh, sort of evolution of the modes is, and so therefore, in theory, can, it can actually find nonlinear modes um, from state space data alone. Um, but on the sort of flip side, uh, while CP decomposition can do this, it ultimately, since it's using optimization based uh, techniques, it can get trapped in local minima, uh, 
uh, in the, the lost landscape. And a priori, you have no idea what your lost landscape looks like. You know, you have no idea how rugged it is. And so often it requires doing multiple random seedings to make sure that you're actually uh, getting to a global minima and not, you know, you're not getting trapped in some, some local minima. Whereas Koopman, while uh, ExactDMD has a lot of uh, strict requirements, it ultimately um, it has a bunch of very simple linear algebra conditions that you can check. And if those conditions are, are met, barring any kind of numerical uh, precision issues, you, you know that you're getting ultimately the optimal um, decomposition uh, and that it's unique. Uh, and similarly, uh, you know, another practical uh, sort of restriction or, or thing to consider about CPD composition is that you have to validate how many modes you use. Like I said, R star is, is difficult in practice to, to compute. And of course, changing the number of modes you're using might change uh, which modes you're sort of extracting from the data. Uh, ideally, this isn't the case, but, uh, you know, in a very simple example, when you're using more than R star number of modes, then you have some sort of um, degeneracy and you can find lots of different uh, modes that satisfy your equation. So, so even though CPD composition is seen as being a very interpretable tool, um, the fact that it can get lost or trapped in, in local minima, and also the fact that you need to validate how many modes to use makes, certainly makes it um, harder to truly be interpretable because sometimes you'll get, uh, you know, different runs will have different modes and then it'll be difficult to know which modes to keep and which modes to, to throw out. Um, now, on the flip side with, with Koopman, to some extent, and, and hopefully this isn't too controversial of a statement, uh, you get the number of modes for free because when you look at the spectrum and at the modes, you can say, well, um, any of the mode that has, uh, you know, sufficiently large enough eigenvalue and sufficiently large enough norm, um, you know, I'll, I'll consider because those are going to be uh, relevant in the future uh, for the dynamics. And um, that's one nice aspect of Koopman. Uh, the, the theory side is that you can actually say that statement about the modes, whereas with CPD composition, it's, uh, it's harder to say that. And so therefore it's harder to know which modes to, to keep. Um, and finally, one nice thing about CPD composition that I haven't really touched on, but another property that makes um, it very appealing to the applied folks is that uh, there exists these non-negative uh, decomposition methods. So for many physical systems, it doesn't make uh, physical sense to have the different uh, elements of your uh, system participating in a negative manner. So for instance, in the neuroscience example, we know that neurons spike or they don't spike, but they don't negatively spike. And so um, these non-negative methods uh, require that the A's uh, and the triplets that I talked about are, are all non-zero. Um, and uh, actually, in addition to giving this sort of nice physical property, it's also been found that non-negative CPD composition has even stronger uniqueness properties, um, which, is, which also makes it, again, more interpretable and nicer. Um, and to my knowledge, there don't exist any non-negative methods uh, in uh, Koopman. Uh, and I think in some, to some extent, it might not, uh, you might not need it um, in the case of using exact DMD, but in using some more complicated methods, I think it might be um, relevant and worth thinking about in including these sort of non-negative conditions into, into these methods. Um, and finally, uh, so this work, like I said, and I've said a few times, it, it's certainly very strongly limited by the, the requirement for linear consistency and a full set of eigenvalues. And it's been known um, that there are cases where these conditions break down, but uh, there are other, other Koopman tools that can properly extract the Koopman modes um, in, certain, in certain cases. And so therefore I think it's very natural and also very uh, will be necessary in order to actually extend this um, equivalence to more practical settings to, to um, consider these methods and try and map them to CPT composition. Um, and, and similarly, in, in another sort of uh, scenario that's more relevant to uh, practical application, uh, we know that, of course, many systems have, have noise and, and real world data is noise in machine learning and in these fields that I talked about. Um, and also in, in fields that Koopman is applied to more. And so uh, it would be interesting to study, study how these methods compare when we add different types of noise. So Koopman, of course, uh, breaks down, or at least the exact DMD conditions break down. Um, so that makes it seem like maybe Koopman would have 
harder time um, extracting the Koopman modes. But uh, at the same time, the since CP ultimately is uh, makes use of optimization based techniques, uh, this certain types of noise could really uh, drastically change the ruggedness of the, the loss landscape. Um, and so it might be that uh, despite sort of these conditions breaking down, in certain cases, exact DMD might do better than CP decomposition and, and vice versa. Um, uh, another, another point, so it's sort of low hanging, but could be interesting is which methods faster. So Koopman requires, you know, you know pseudo inversion, usually of large matrices, which can be kind of slow depending on how you do it and what your, what kind of shape your matrix is. Um, but on the other hand, CP decomposition requires usually lots of runs through, um, your optimization algorithm and also requires uh, many different random seedings. So I think uh, if I had to place my bet, I would say that Koopman uh, would be faster. Uh, and then finally, this, this was a point that was pointed out to me by a friend of mine, Action Ogre, who um, wondered whether uh, the Koopman modes, even in cases where maybe uh, the exact TMD conditions uh, break down, can they be used as good initial guesses in the CP decomposition algorithm? Um, and, and, I, and I like this idea that, you know, maybe uh, Koopman is a good first step in, you know, extracting some of the relevant linear modes or, uh, you know, linear modes that sort of, to some extent, describe the data. And then you can plug those into CP decomposition and it can do some refining and get you uh, more accurate modes. Um, and also maybe it would help alleviate this problem of, of uh, needing lots of random seeds. But uh, this remains to be seen and it might, might be that um, this, this uh, doesn't work or it, it works, but in very limited cases. So uh, that will sort of remains to be seen. Uh, and that's all I've got. So thank you to um, you all for listening and for, to some colleagues and, and friends who um, uh, supported the project. And if you're interested, uh, the paper with all the details is out in chaos. Um, and just note that I use tensor component analysis in the, in the paper instead of CP. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to ask now or, or shoot me an email. Uh, thanks. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Yeah, about the uniqueness, huh? <clears throat> you you said carefully that it can be unique. Right. Right. Now the question is, and you gave nice condition, and it looks like this is a central issue. In right. terms of the comparison here. So it's natural to ask you can we massage the data so it will be always unique? Ooh, that's a good question. Yeah, I like that. I'm not actually sure. I, I, I guess, I mean, the central problem I, I assume is, is in general that these, these, um, ranks sometimes might might not be very large, um, in which case the, the modes are sort of very much overlapping. Um, yeah, I like that question a lot, but I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. I'm motivated by the fact that PCA can be sometimes extended as weighted PCA. Right. And some people even use projected PCA. And that's probably to increase the relevance to a case. Right. Okay, so that, that was my motivation aside of just the linguistic thing. If it can be, that means sometimes it's not. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> that's all. So uh. it's, Yeah, well, thank you. That, that's, a, that's a good question. And I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but um, I like it. I like the idea. Would be nice to hear what happens. Yeah, yeah definitely. <laughs> yeah, so there's a question on the chat. I mean, I think the. Oh. Ah, okay. So, so the question, 
uh, is a good one because it, it's, it's asking about um, when you do these some of these repeated ex experiments, um, uh, sometimes uh, each one of these experiments has different uh, amount of time time points. So your so your tensor isn't maybe uh, um, full of uh, uh, as in you know you'd have to. It, well, it, it, tensor might not actually be the best way to, to describe your data because um, some of your elements don't don't exist, and so. Um, this does happen to some extent in, in neuroscience, but uh, less of it's less generally of a problem. And so I don't think I don't think in general uh, padding padding uh, these these experiments with zeros uh, would necessarily work because that would assume that you're, it would imply that you have some sort of knowledge about those those um, sensors. Uh, I know I know there is support for this um, if you use a tensor lab. There's some good good work, and and there are ways that people have there's different ways that people have developed CPD composition to deal with uh, missing data. Um, but personally, I'm less uh, familiar with that, um, uh, and it would be uh, more challenging, I guess, from the Koopman side. You know, you could do exact DMD on each one of your uh, data matrices or each one of these trials, even if they have different a uh, number of time points. Uh, you could for each one of these trials, extract the, the modes, um, and then consider the modes of all the uh, all the experiments together, or the entire experiment together, uh, if that makes sense. But but uh, yeah, so I would say so that uh, most CPD composition methods have some sort of extension to to missing data. All right. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Yeah, is there another question? Is there another question? Yes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, uh, hey, Will, thank you for the talk. Um, I have a question. You mentioned the advantage of CPD over Koopman uh, when we consider uh, non negative matrix decomposition. So uh -huh. I wonder if you can comment on this topic with respect to the dual of the Koopman, um, which is a Perron Frobenius operator and potentially. If you have a way to construct it, you could um, transport probability distributions, and you can maintain, uh, for instance, the positivity of your data. Right, right, right. That's a really good idea. Yeah, I like that. So, so sorry, you're saying that uh, going from the Perron representation to the Pikumin representation? Um, or did you Actually, actually, the other way around, right? Oh, other, okay. You were oh, saying uh, CPD is somewhat beneficial over Koopman, if I got that right, because it can be combined with uh, non-negative non matrix decomposition. Right, right. Whereas right, right. with Koopman, it's not as clear how to do that. Uh, but if you go to the dual, um, I don't know. I, think, I guess the question is whether you um, have, have been thinking about this or, or not. Well, so I haven't been, but I, <laughs> I, I like the, I like that idea because I mean, I guess you're right. The, the prone Frobenius um, would give you a more natural way of doing. Well, yeah, yeah I guess it would, it would give you a more natural way to do this non-negative uh, approach because your your probability distributions would, would of course be non-negative. Um, but then I guess I'm not entirely clear how you would map that to. CPD composition. I mean, I, I guess maybe you don't have to, but but if you're saying that uh, to to get Koopman to have non-native methods, then maybe yeah, that would be the right way to go. Um, yeah, that's a good point as well. I, I don't. I hadn't thought about it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Amir. All right, thank you. Uh, other questions? Yeah, all right. So it seems that, uh, yeah, that there are no further questions. Yeah, anyway, yeah, thanks uh, all for coming. And uh, as I mentioned, this is the last uh, talk for the academic uh, year, and we'll uh, probably resume in, uh, yeah, in October, probably towards the end or something. Yeah, and then I'll keep you updated uh, through the mailing list. Yeah. Uh, okay, thanks all, and uh, take care, everyone. Bye bye. Have, enjoy the summer. Yeah, bye. Thanks, Bombay. Thanks, bye.